Welcome back to another episode of Rock Boys Football. We've talked extensively about this Oregon Ducks program over the last couple of weeks, and a lot of our conversations have had to do with what Oregon is doing on the recruiting trail. I think a lot of people are forgetting that this Oregon team heading into 2024, one of the most dangerous teams that we see in the country, specifically on the offensive side of the football. And as I continue to kind of do work with all of these programs, I keep coming back to this Oregon Ducks offense and kind of want to dive into the question, does this Oregon team have the best offense in the country heading into 2024? Want to get into a few reasons why this very well could be true come the 2024 college football season. Before we get into it, as always, just want to say thank you to you guys. And during the off season, it's just been a blast taking deep dives into all of these programs. The amount of support you guys continue to show, it truly does mean a lot. If y'all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. Much more importantly, I know there's going to be a lot of people that disagree with this in the comment section. We're going to do a separate episode stacking the best offenses, at least in my opinion, that we see in the country. But I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section. And without further ado, let's get into this one. I feel like most of the conversation has to do with Dylan Gabriel coming in at quarterback, Evan Stewart and Tess Johnson at wide receiver. We're going to talk about those names in just a minute. I want to start with Oregon on the offensive line. I mean, name me how many other programs across the country enter the 2024 season with your starting offensive tackles, both projected to be first round NFL draft picks come the NFL draft in 2025. That's where Oregon is sitting. I think the only other team that can say that is probably LSU. When you look at a Johnny Cornelius and what he did his first year at the power five level, he was phenomenal. I mean, you look at only gave up zero, zero sacks. 10 quarterback hurries. And then the other side at the left tackle spot, you're looking at Josh Connolly Jr., who played really well as a sophomore in his second year in 2023. But I thought what really stood out to me about Josh Connolly Jr. is he consistently gotten better during his first year starting in 2023. You take a look at the last six games for Josh Connolly Jr., he gave up zero sacks, only three quarterback hurries. I mean, you saw him really hit his stride at the end of 2023. If he can kind of continue that in 2024, you are looking at two of you know, probably top five tackles across the country are going to be starting for the Oregon Ducks. You look on the inside, you have a guy in Marcus Harper who's going to be year three starting with this program. Then you bring in Matthew Bedford from Indiana, who's played 2,700 snaps during his career. I haven't found an offensive lineman that has more experience than Matthew Bedford kind of plugging in that right guard position. Then Poncho at center from what we saw of him as a true freshman, we feel really good about what he can do taking over for Powers Johnson. I look at this Oregon offensive line and it, not a lot of people are talking about it. You look at this and kind of the talent and the experience that they have and say, this is going to be one of the best offensive lines that we see across the country in 2024. Now let's get into some other conversations first. Let's go with Dylan Gabriel. This is a guy that I think a lot of people forget is top 10 in the history of college football and passing, which is uh, you think about all the quarterbacks that have played college football. I mean, that is an impressive stat in and of itself. And I think the first thing I want to start with is you look at what made uh, Bo Nix or Michael Penix so great in 2023. I think it largely had to do with just the sheer experience that they had at the college football level. I mean, you saw them just be so comfortable running their offenses at Oregon and at Washington. And the reason that I bring that up is I think there's a very similar reason Dylan Gabriel is going to have a lot of success in this Oregon offense is this is a guy that has just played a ton of football at the college level, going into his sixth year, and a guy that I think is going to have a lot of success just because he's seen a lot of college football, and he's going to be one of the sharpest and more polished quarterbacks that you see in the country. I think the second thing that it kind of fires me up about Dylan Gabriel being a perfect fit in this Oregon offense is you look at what Dylan Gabriel does well, it's ball out quick, on time, accurately. I mean, the knock on Dylan Gabriel's game is that does he have the NFL caliber arm? That's certainly a question mark heading into 2024. What I'm saying is it, it doesn't really matter because you look at how Kyle Coach Stein has developed this offense. You look at Bo Nix last year, his average depth of target was 6.8 yards down the field. Only 30%, or I should say 35% 
of Bo Nix's throws went plus 10 yards down the field. I mean, a lot of where Oregon was operating on the offensive side of the football was those short intermediate route concepts where Bo Nix was exceptional at getting the ball out quick on time to his playmakers. We look at what Dylan Gabriel has excelled at during his college career, ball quick on time to your playmaker. So I think the fit in this Will Stein offense is perfect for Dylan Gabriel. And that's not me taking a shot at Bo Nix or Dylan Gabriel, who both have the arms to push it, to push the ball down the field. I just think that that's how this Coach Stein offense has kind of been constructed. And you look at Dylan Gabriel and what he does best, I think he just fits exactly what Will Stein wants to do on offense. This is not an offense that is going to be asking Dylan Gabriel to routinely push the ball down to the deeper third. He's going to be asked to do it, and we've seen Dylan Gabriel make those kind of throws. It's just not going to be a massive part of this Oregon offense. Going to number three, best wide receiver room in the country, it's certainly an argument. I mean, you look at some other teams across the country, Ohio State, you look at Ole Miss, Oregon's going to be right up in there. And I think you start with Tess Johnson coming back, who because Troy Franklin was so good for Oregon and Bo Nix kind of – I think got a lot of the national media attention. Tess Johnson just kind of flew under the radar all of last year as being one of the most productive wide receivers that we saw in the country. And again, you look at Dylan Gabriel and who was his favorite wide receiver target at Oklahoma. It was the slot wide receiver, Drake Stoops. I look at Tess Johnson and just say he might just be a better version of Drake Stoops, who 22 missed tackles for us last year, 727 yards after the catch. This is a guy that, again, going back to what Will Stein wants to do on offense, this is a perfect wide receiver for the Will Stein offense and a perfect wide receiver for Dylan Gabriel. And then I think the next question is, who's going to be that boundary wide receiver that can work vertically? You look at some of the concepts that Oregon had really good success with was, hey, to create that space for Tess Johnson, you needed a wide receiver that – could work vertically down the field. Last year, that was Troy Franklin. I think this year it's going to be Evan Stewart, who uh, you want to talk about a couple of just criminally disrespected players on this Oregon team. I think one is Evan Stewart. I think secondly is Jordan James. We're going to talk about him in just a few minutes. You look at Evan Stewart, and I think you say this was a guy that going into his true sophomore year, so about 12 months ago, we were talking about as a top five wide receiver in the country going into his true, true sophomore year. And you look at Texas A&M last year, starting quarterback goes down, just a ton of turmoil within that program. Evan Stewart himself struggling with injuries. I feel like just a ton of people forgot how good Evan Stewart was as a true freshman. I mean, coming into an offense that he's going to get a lot of opportunity, coming into an offense where he has a very good quarterback that is going to get getting him the football. I look at Evan Stewart and say, you might be looking at one of the best wide receivers. I truly think you're looking at one of the best wide receivers in the country with Evan Stewart. And then you sprinkle in these other wide receivers where it's not only a, a deep wide receiver room, but it's got a lot of different skill sets. Like Treshawn Holden, a guy that can work the middle of the field just about as good as any wide receiver we see in the country. You look at Gary Bryan, a guy that would start on a lot of power five programs, just not Oregon. Kyle Casper saw an offseason picture of him. He looks like he's going to be an alpha boundary wide receiver. Former five-star wide receiver, Jerry on Dickey. There's so many different skill sets in this Oregon wide receiver room with a polished veteran quarterback. I look at this wide receiver room and say it is, I think it's almost better. I think it is better than what it was last year. Even though you lose Troy Franklin, I think you replace him with Evan Stewart. You just run back the rest. It is extremely loaded. Not to mention you have Terrence Ferguson and Kenny Sadiq at the tight end position. At just a lot of playmakers for Will Stein and Dylan Gabriel to get the ball to. Number four, underrated running back room. We said Evan Stewart, one of, in my opinion, one of the most disrespected players that we see in the country. Jordan James is another one. And the conversations around Jordan James being left off top 10 running backs in the country, all American teams. That you look back at Jordan James last year, 7.1 yards per carry, over four yards per carry after contact. There is and this is not a shot at Bucky Irvin. The Oregon fans that have been rocking with the fellas for the last 12 months know that I am a massive fan of Bucky Irving. There's an argument to be made that Jordan James was the better running back last year. Now, Bucky Irving does some things that Jordan James doesn't in terms of pass catching, what he can do in space, but as a pure ball carrier, 
between the tackles, Jordan James was phenomenal and just doesn't get enough hype heading into 2024. You say Jordan James behind this kind of offensive line, this running game is going to be massive. And that's not even to mention Noah Whittington coming back from injury and why a running back that played really well until he got hurt. And then you have the division two transfer and Jay Harris that if y'all watch the spring game, he's going to be a dude. So it's not only a running back room that I think has a, a arguable top 10 running back in the country and Jordan James, but it's deep. I mean, these guys can get a lot of different carries, do a lot of different things. And I think the last thing you got to talk about that is not a personnel conversation, but it means something in terms of projecting offenses heading into a fall year 200 coach Bill Stein. And I think I spelled his name wrong. I think that should be E I N. I apologize. Will Stein, a guy that I've been banging the table for over the last couple of months, which makes it even worse that I spelled his name wrong. One of my favorite offensive coordinators that we see in the country. Why I want to highlight this. This is year two of Will Stein in the offense. I think you always see jumps from coordinators who get year two's continuity within coordinators is massive. Dan Lanning has that heading into 2024, but specifically on offense. Look, I get that you are replacing Bo Nix at quarterback with the new quarterback, but I think being able to keep the language the same for the offensive line and pass protection for a lot of the wide receivers that have been here the last couple of years, you, uh, Dylan Gabriel is the least of my concern in coming in and picking up this playbook. I think he's very similar to Bo Nix. He's a guy that understands football at a high level because he's played a lot of football and a guy that's coming as a graduate student where his job is going to be quarterback of the Oregon Ducks. And so there's not going to be that much of an adjustment period of Dylan Gabriel picking up the playbook, but for everybody else, the younger guys on this team, they all get to go into year two with Will Stein, with the language being the same. Now it kind of gets to, instead of installing the playbook during the full off season, it starts to be, how can we master this playbook and run the routes and run the plays even better than we did in 2023. I think that's a massive conversation to have as well. I look at this Oregon team and say, an offensive line that might be one of the better units in the country, a wide receiver room that might be one of the better wide receiver rooms in the country, a running back room that's the same with a quarterback that I think not only is just a very, very good quarterback, but also a perfect fit in this Oregon offense. Year two under a great OC, I look at this Oregon Ducks team and say, name me that many offenses that you're taking over Oregon heading into 2024. Because I think the answer is just not that many. Really excited about this offense. We'll break down all our best offenses that we see in the country. Uh, kind of July conversations. Appreciate you guys rocking with it again. If y'all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. Appreciate you guys. We'll talk to y'all later.